Community Engagement State Forum. I'm Andrew South, I'm the first lieutenant of the Naval Park Fire Brigade. Beside me here is Matthew Pond, Brigade Support Officer for District 8. As I mentioned in the preamble to getting started, um, this is a strategy of which we've uh, initiated in the Greater Dandenong area um, within District 8 of CFA, um, specifically with the Noble Park Brigade, which we're looking at uh, rolling out as far and wide as we possibly can. CFA, um, who we are, um, a volunteer and community-based organisation, um, uh, or emergency services organisation. SES people in the room, are you able to, uh, do you know your who we are statement? Hey, when you pay okay. the list, you just come up. We um, had a, the, the previous session of which we had, um, there were a couple of SDS people who did kind of know the basics of it um, and uh, stated that it was very similar um, with the key word there, um, similar to what uh, Craig Ipsy was talking about earlier of that community um, and, and working towards that community connection. So who in the room actually knows their community demographic? So I've seen one hand so far. Right, well this is a census taken from 2011 of the Noble Park area. So as you can see here, over 62.3% were born overseas, 58.6% speaking the same language other than English at home. So before we started this initiative, the brigade, Noah Park Brigade, had 17 members. Out of those 17, 15 were male and two were female. All were born within Australia. The brigade SDS was around 22%. For those who um, don't know what SDS is, we had a couple in the last session from other agencies. Um, it's a uh, service delivery standard, um, so it's a benchmark for our performance of uh, service delivery to the community. With this initiative, there was three steps. The first step was engagement. The second step was education. And the third step was recruitment. So with the engagement, the first step we took was to seek help from the other agencies within our area, such as the Red Cross and local AIMS, to try to um, bridge that gap between us and the newly settled people in the community, such as asylum seekers and refugees, and establish a, a, a bond with those agencies. So this uh, specifically saw um, a, a partnership arrangement with Red Cross where they financially um, supported um, the process of recruiting some members um, and uh, also providing support in some other areas like development of, um, of uh, locally settled people um, to be at the level where they could join um, the CFA. So one of the things of which we found um, initially when we engaged and, and started educating was that um, people coming from overseas saw CFA as being an authority, um, similar to a policing authority. So there was a bit of reluctance in actually engaging um, and um, saw the uniform as fairly intimidating um, and thought that there may be Kind of repercussions in some areas for engaging the services of which CFA and SASCS as well um, provide um, to the community. Um, so the more we've uh, gone through education and engagement, um, we've been able to lower some barriers, um, which is supported through, we're saying stage two now, but leads into stage three of the recruitment as well. So some of those key points were bilingual, bilingual and translators, so bilingual signage, so similar to the first slide we had here, the introduction slide, on the front door of the fire station there's a, there's a safety message saying uh, smoke alarm save lives. Underneath that we have that translated into Vietnamese. We have several uh, signage we can take around with us as well that has different languages uh, for different events. The third step was recruitment. So if the community is engaged, about, well, sorry, about what the CFA does and who we actually are, the doors that open for those members to be recruited. Further education, specifically on the fact of brigade membership, so whether they be operational or operational, this is where that happens. So we, we, we educate them on what the brigade or the CFA is and what we do, and we actually educate them on the roles that we're offering. 
Okay, so that, that is the third step in terms of, all right, we're ready for um, recruitment. We've gone through uh, education, engagement, um, establishing that connection, now we're recruiting. Um, the first thing that we need to do before we actually um, say, yep, we're, we're gonna do it, um, is make sure your brigade culture um, is inclusive and respectful of diversity. Um, so all members need to be um, aware follow brigade code of conduct and values as well as CFA code of conduct and values um, and also that members are generally open and uh, inclusive and respectful for practices and traditions of other cultures. Uh, so that was uh, one step of which was really drilled through the brigade um, and then the second initiative for which the brigade um, established was... So the brigade actually sought out a multicultural coordinator. So there's a member of the brigade who was working with the local Red Cross um, we actually brought her in as part of the brigade management team and her role was to be the link between the brigade and those members and those initial steps and to assist in any way she, that she could during the recruitment stage. So it's a pretty messy slide here so I'll be brief on this one. But, but a bit of background about Naval Park, previous, previous to rolling out this initiative we had three applications in a six month period with zero members actually joining up. Uh, after we ran our information sessions, we ended up we had 90 applications. So we've gone from three in six months to 90. We had, a we had around 20 positions we wanted to, to fill with a target of about 25% of those positions being for females. So there's four steps there. So the first step was attend the information session. So we ended up having five in total. Step two was a basic screening. So telephone, um, call, uh, one-on-one -one interviews was then followed with step three. Um, with the brigade management team. And then step four was to fill in the paperwork. The important part of the process was that we didn't, it didn't actually say that nobody was accepted in terms of we had 20 come through. Um, so it wasn't that we, we phoned the rest and said, sorry, you weren't successful. Um, it was some work was required, um, some time was required. Um, and we had the uh, partnership with uh, Red Cross and Ames um, in particular. Um, that allowed us to kind of move some members into some develop, development um, and some, some uh, process towards uh, achieving membership at a later stage. Um, so that's ongoing um, and uh, um, we're in, in a slide to come, we'll, we'll talk about uh, where we're going from that. So this is where the, the paperwork's all done now, it's time for the recruit course. So we, we initially set the recruit course to have to run on one one night during the week, being a Thursday, with an extra catch-up session. So those members who couldn't come uh, could make up the time on a Sunday, or those who wanted extra training, they could come on Sunday as well. Uh, we had three instructors and two support uh, members uh, during the recruit course. So a lot of recruit courses, there's one or two people standing at the front similar to what we're doing today, uh, feeding everyone the information. We actually had it so there's one person at the front and we had other members supporting those who were learning and going around the room helping out when need be. Uh, as it says there, casual clothes, no uniform, so it's nice and relaxed. Uh, we made them feel welcome, so we actually went and made a, uh, a makeshift <coughs> rack hook for them. So they actually have some, we had some old yellow ovals out the back from many years ago. We dusted off, got them clean, and we, had, we gave that to them. So they had a sense of being they had a CFA hull and a CFA overalls, they felt part of the team. Uh, we also focused on team building exercises, and uh, as opposed to a, a theory, then a practical based uh, component of our training, we actually mixed it together. So there's some sessions were theory based, and then halfway through the session, we we'll to do some practical. Mix up a bit, get them more involved, get them more enthused. So if you notice in that photo, we've got our Chief Officer, Ewan Ferguson, who came out to um, assist, or he actually led our wildfire firefighting. Um, we had a significant amount of support from uh, higher levels within CFA, um, which assisted with um, our, our retention and, and just the general feeling of support um, uh, by the recruits at that, at that uh, ground level. Um, and uh, also from our catchment officer and group um, officer um, throughout the process, which was, which was very beneficial. Um, so moving um, to, to that support uh, comment that was made just before by Andrew is that um, 
we didn't just put the standard recruit course in CFA, we kind of have our theory of, uh, or practical training um, and then at the end of the, the session it's, okay, see you next Thursday or see you next Sunday or whatever day it may be. Um, that was the general process of how uh, you know, courses up to this time um, had, had run. Uh, what, what changed with this course with the strategy was, okay, the course uh, finished for the, for the night, the next day um, the, the recruit member would get a phone call, how are you going, how did you find last night, um, and uh, be given the opportunity to, to give feedback um, and do it in a one-on-one -on -one environment um, where they didn't feel like they were falling behind the, the rest of the group. Um, so I won't read through all of that up there, um, but those were some of the, the uh, things of which we implemented um, to ensure that um, our retention um, was, was there throughout the course and um, it, it was very successful in terms of we haven't, um, haven't uh, lost many members. So those who remember one of the initial slides, we showed we had 17 members. After this initiative was completed, we actually ended up with 53 members, eight of those female and 45 males. We've gone from a brigade that was 100% born in Australia to now having 40% of our members born overseas. We now have 15 different languages spoken in our brigade, which also allows us to communicate better with our community. And the brigade SDS has gone from 22% to around the 70, 80 mark. So there's been a big jump after this initiative. So importantly, looking back to the census data, which was at the start of the slide, you can see that where the brigade is today, it is moving towards that census data, which is establishing that community connection and essentially the brigade is representative of the community. So along with the operational um, uh, stats there, um, the brigade is also very focused on continuing its community education engagement. Um, a lot of uh, multicultural um, events happen within the Greater Daniel area um, through council and uh, other um, uh, community bodies. Um, so the brigade is out there and in engaging and trying to, um, to, to be represented um, in as many situations as we can. Um, and we've also had fairly good media publicity from both internal media um, within CFA and also local media through the uh, Daniel <coughs> Leader. So that, that kind of finishes off the, the strategy of which has been implemented. Um, I'll just check how much time we've got left for questions, Lindsay. How are we going for time? Lindsay? Sorry, how much, how much time have we got? Ten, sorry, ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Um, so, so, yeah, that's kind of the basics of what we, we went through in terms of developing the strategy and implementing it into Noble Park. And as I said at the start, we're, we're now looking at uh, trying to um, make this a, a, a strategy which is available to, to everybody to, to work off what Noble Park has done. Um, so if you have any questions now, um, that would be happy to. Yes, Frank? Uh, on the last slide there, so you yeah. retention, retention strategies. Yes. So you, you your first recruit course that you found, so like that initial interest once it's combined, what have you done to maintain it or retain it? Well, the, the first thing I'd like to say with this is that um, from seeing a number of brigades and how they've gone through recruit courses, um, the strategies of which have been implemented in here have actually retained more than what a standard recruit course does. Um, so during a during recruit course, um, during the actual training, is one key area where you lose people of interest. Uh, who from, from CFA has seen that before, that you lose people during the training? Um, so that one of the key things of which we, um, we uh, had um, in place was that contact. Um, so particularly with people who were uh, newly settled into the Noble Park community, actually calling them and, and have them say, I feel like I'm behind the rest of the class. And you go, well, I've just made 10 phone calls and they've all said that. Um, so it's not, not you. Um, it, it, we need to work as a team and, and move forward together. Um, the other thing which we did, and Andrew was the lead instructor, the instructor for the course, was we, Andrew uh, saw that um, there was a group within um, the, the bigger group that was well probably ahead than where the rest of the course was. So as we got to probably about week six or so, it was quite clear that we needed to separate into two groups. 
um, one where there's a bit more support given to and there's a, another group where um, there was uh, a kind of a, a quicker path to getting their competencies um, signed off. Um, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, okay. At the front. Definitely, yeah. So the question for those at the back who may not have heard was, um, uh, can can we go into who was involved in the strategy to begin with, who initiated and, and how we kind of progressed to, to get the ball rolling, essentially? Um, the CFA, over the last, uh, well, probably about three years ago, uh, had some funding from um, uh, state government for a volunteer support project. I'm not sure. Actually, Steve might know, was that SES as well? Did they? No. Okay, so it was a CFA, and uh, as part of that, there was a, a resource at the state level um, which was focused specifically on um, engaging diverse communities. Um, so that, that person kind of linked in with um, uh, regional resources um, and uh, uh, established some, some kind of statewide partnerships which assisted us in uh, local connections. Um, it, it really kind of gave us the, the advice, the training um, and the understanding um, which we've kind of fed into this PowerPoint and discussion today of which we needed to know how to go about um, engaging our local resources. Um, so that, that was key um, in terms of having that information. Um, so then from there we went off and, and actually had meetings with our local AIMS and Red Cross um, we then established a grant as to where they needed support from. So they were, they, they're kind of in, in that agreement of which we had subcontracted to CFA because um, they had funding from government also to try and move people who had newly been settled into the community into volunteer roles. So it worked for them and it worked for us. So it was very easy to, to get the ball rolling in terms of they had all these uh, newly settled community members that they needed to put into volunteering roles and we wanted people for volunteering roles to assist with the brigade's operation, viability particularly. Um, so it kind of fed in, in through that. Um, we had support from uh, CFA regional office and as I mentioned through there, even from the state and as high as our chief officer levels, so it was all um, a big team effort from, from each level within CFA. Um, but if you're after some initial advice, I'm happy to give some contact details and have a chat with you later. At the back. Just a quick question. Now, you've come from Noble Park. I come out from Yuna. The biggest thing we are struggling with at the moment is that a lot of older members that don't want to be doing training because they have this attitude of I've been in the CFA for 30 years, why should I do it? The other issue we're having is how do we get them to be, like, to get re uh, interested back in training and you know, re encourage them to past what they have because they have some very valuable knowledge of that area. How do we get them to then re-engage with us? Okay, so that, that's not necessarily talking about diversity within the brigade, that's more so about um, talking about some of the older members within the brigade transiting, uh, like passing on skills to younger members? Yeah, so the, the, the reason I say that is because we don't have a yeah. Like yeah. Uh, and that's a, a standard thing you find across brigades, um, and and that's where we spoke about. Uh, I used the word barriers before. Yeah. Um, the, the key thing of which we needed to do with Noble Park and and what Andrew spoke about earlier is you've got a brigade that was was pretty much on the, the brink of being shut down. In, in a sense, it was for how about a couple of months, yeah, uh, two or three months. As in, it, it was classed as unviable. Um, so something needed to be done. Um, which was a prompter for Noble Park um, to say, well, we need to look at other options. Um, so we've, in your situation, you've probably got the brigade going along all right um, in terms of its viability, um, as in you haven't had a trigger point where you've had to have a, a, a significant change. Um, but this is where we need to look at the barriers that are up there. Um, and uh, if, if that is something of which is affecting your viability and you've got a multicultural um, uh, diversity within uh, Yina, um, then um, uh, what, that, that's where we need to, to reduce those barriers and look at recruiting from those diverse communities because to be 
connect it with your community. Um, to be reflective of community, you need to have that community participation within the brigade as well. So there's there's some resources on our CFA uh, brigades online. Um, a lot of townships have been profiled as well, um, and census data is available um, fairly regularly. So maybe have a look and see see what uh, see what the you know community is like. Any further questions? Okay. Yeah, um, one of the things that might help there for you know that worked very well with Noble Park Brigade is they actually got. Uh, a lot of the older members who actually had the experience do one-on-one -on -one mentoring with individuals. That's and that was a great way of getting those that have a lot of knowledge a to be able to work on one individual person. And that, that, that worked exceptional. They could work at the speed that was required. Uh, and that, I think, got a lot of motivation back into those older members too. That, that's excellent. Thank you for that. That's great. Yeah. We, we should give a, a welcome to ex-captain Keith Packenham of the Noble Park Fire Brigade as well. <laughs> so, thanks. Thanks, Keith. Uh, final question. Uh, I was just going to ask, with the, the members you recruited for operational, or did you also recruit for non-operational? Uh, so the question is, do we recruit for non-operational or operational? So we, we opened it up to anything. So really, really we wanted operational because the issue was getting the truck out the door. Um, so we actually said, this is what we require. But if you have if you have the need and the want, and you don't want to do that just yet, that's fine. We do have this option as well, being an operational. Um, out of out of the 23, we ended up taking on. Uh, we only have one member who's decided to be non-operational, so the rest are all operational. So that was actually a really good win on our part to be able to get that tr that truck full and out the door. So we do have that option open for them as well. If there's no further questions. Just. Just for anybody, if you do have any further questions, or otherwise we're going to be around for the next uh, couple of days as everybody else is, so feel free to come up and have a chat with us. Thank you, Thank you very much.